at a bus terminal in Derry, Northern Ireland, a man is seen buying a ticket and boarding a bus no different from any other passenger, except for this man doesn't exist. The destination to the ticket the man bought was Sligo, a seaside resort town on the coast of Ireland. Not much there, but a bunch of cheap souvenir stalls, a beach, and a whole lot of pasty Irish who put the D in vitamin deficiency. Yeah, I get it. You're Irish, and you're offended. The man on the bus calls himself Peter Bergman, and he seemingly arrived in Derry like he'd been transported down from a spaceship, because there's no record of him entering any border on the Septic Isle. In fact, a subsequent Interpol check shows that there's no record of him anywhere. And in a town where grown men still call themselves Mikey, you'd think a man over six foot tall with a heavy Austrian accent and good teeth might go noticed. In this world, there are things that go beyond our understanding. Things that our tiny minds cannot possibly comprehend. Like where does reality end and dreams begin? Between the flick of a light switch and a dream, we continually shroud ourselves in a veil of illusion. Welcome to Sligo, an honest-to-goodness Irish tourist destination. Pack your speedos, boys, and point me out where I can get myself some potatoes, because I'm famished, to be sure. It seems unlikely that we will ever know the reason why Peter Bergman chose Sligo as a destination, a town known more for its throat tattoos on its women than its fine dining locations. But nevertheless, this is where our story begins, and it ends. Bergman arrived at the hotel by cab as a walk-in, meaning he had no reservation. He'd asked the driver to bring him to a cheap place. Hotel Sligo was his second choice, as the first one was booked up. Traveling lightly with only a black carrier bag, Bergman filled out the details and booked a room for three nights. He showed them no ID, and he paid for all three nights up front in cash. Signing in using the name Peter Bergman with two N's. Where most countries use one N, Austrian nationals use two. He listed his home address in Austria, which was later determined to be a vacant lot. It now appears that both his name and address were fake. Peter Bergman would stay in room 705 for the last three nights of his life and his death clock was now ticking. Bergman would get up the next day at about eight o'clock and go down for breakfast, where he would say nothing to the staff, only a nod of recognition. From 8.30 in the morning, Bergman would leave his hotel at least 14 times a day, and each time carrying an unbranded purple plastic bag, its contents still unknown. And upon each return to that hotel, he did so without that bag. Police now believe that he disposed of the contents of the bags with the knowledge of where the security cameras were, so the items would never be found. But what baffles investigators is that he was also carrying a large black duffel bag when he entered. He could have disposed of everything at once if that's what he was trying to do. Why the separate trips? And why a purple plastic bag? Was it so he could be tracked? But if so, why did he knowingly avoid the CCTV cameras when he disposed of everything? It 
was Saturday afternoon that a member of the cleaning staff knocked on the door of room 705, and although they thought they heard someone inside, no one answered. So they contacted the manager, promptly went up to the room, and entered it. When she went inside, Bergman was standing there with a horrified look on his face, like he'd been expecting someone to come for him, but he was relieved that it was a member of the hotel staff. What was Peter Bergman hiding from? What was he afraid of? What was in those plastic bags? Is there more to this story that meets the eye? On Sunday, Bergman was up extra early, about 7.30, and he seemed impatient, like a man who was on a mission. It was 11 a.m. that he approached the taxi cab driver in front of the hotel, and he pointed to a map and he wanted to know a quiet beach in the area where he could go for a swim. He then asked the cab driver to take him there. It was a 20 minute ride. When he got there, he got out of the cab. He looked around for five minutes, got back in the cab, returned to the hotel, and tipped the driver $10. On Monday, Bergman went to the front desk and requested a late checkout because he had business to see to. Carrying his purple bag, he went to the post office and he bought eight stamps with eight airmail stickers. CCTV footage did not catch him mail, any letters or any items, but it is believed that he corresponded with someone. But who? It seems that there had to be at least eight people. At 1.07 p.m., Bergman, making one final run with his purple bag, checks out and hands in his key. It's interesting to note that he checks out of the hotel with three bags, a hold all, a purple bag, and a shoulder bag. This is interesting to note because the hold all is not the bag that he arrived with. After leaving the hotel, he walks back to the bus depot. A walk that usually takes six minutes took him 24, and none of it was caught on CCTV cameras. Entering the bus depot, he goes to a cafe and orders a ham and cheese sandwich with a cappuccino. He then takes out a notebook and reads it, then rips out the pages and tears them up. This appears to be the same notebook that he was reading in the hotel lobby. A to-do list, perhaps? It was at 2.40 that Bergman bought a one-way ticket to Ross's Point Beach. Once on the beach, Bergman stood out and was noticed. Dressed in black, tall, carrying a newspaper under his arm, he seemed out of place. He was last seen about 11 o'clock that night by a couple out for a walk on the beach. He was walking in about two inches of water along the shoreline with his pants rolled up, his shoes off. The couple said hi. He didn't answer, but he nodded. It's about 6.30 in the morning that a father and son out for a morning swim saw what they believed to be a mannequin. And that mannequin was the man who had called himself Peter Bergman. He was fully dressed except for his shoes. And the father and son said the Lord's Prayer over his body. But when they got Bergman back to the meat shop, nothing was what it seemed. The first bizarre thing that they'd noticed was that he'd cut off every tag on every piece of clothing that he was wearing, even his underwears. He'd completely wiped away any trace of his identity, clean as a soul on a cripple's boot. But the biggest shock was about to come when they got him on the slab and lifted his hood. The man who went for a midnight swim with his clothes on was already the walking dead. It seemed he had more heart attacks than retards had smarty dinners. His muscles were wasting away they were surprised they weren't in a wheelchair. And he had tumors all over his body. And it appeared he wasn't even taking painkillers like some sort of goddamn Superman. And with advanced prostate cancer, 
it were only a matter of weeks before he were called home to the baby Jesus. But what was the man who called himself Peter Bergman's caper? If he was terminally ill and he wanted to end it, why all the Cold War dramatics? Just book the ticket, put on your Speedo, and do it. And what was in the purple bag? Making over 72 trips? Dumping it so we couldn't see it, making sure you stay out of the eye of the CCTV? Something don't smell right, and it ain't that Irish cooking. And if you didn't want anybody to know, why'd you send out those eight letters? Yes.